uh, this final workshop located here is on the topic of the catechism. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a topic that I can recommend, a subject that I, that I can overestimate or overstate rather uh, the importance of learning the faith. And as it turns out, um, I left my catechism back there. Could someone run and, and, and give me the, the, uh, the St. Joseph Baltimore catechism there? Thank you. Yes, that's it. That's it. And um, I'll open with a little story to make a point. Some of you might have heard me tell the story before, but it's the story of uh, Father O'Malley. Father O'Malley was in the church in Dublin, and he was given a thunderous sermon. And the walls were shaken, and the stained glass was, was rattling, and he was really in magnificent, dramatic oratory. And at one point, for dramatic effect, he said to the congregation, he said, stand up, all of those who want to go to heaven. So of course, everybody stood up. He said, okay, sit down. So they all sat down. And then he said, stand up, all of those who want to go to hell. No one stood up, except Flanagan right in the middle of the church. The priest said, Flanagan, are you telling me that you want to go to hell? And Flanagan said, no, Father, but I didn't like to see you standing up there by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> is, this is um, a kind of uh, backwards way of saying that right now, to really know the Catholic faith as it should be known, to be what I will call a basic run-of-the-mill Catholic, you're gonna be standing up there by yourself. You're gonna be very much alone. Uh, I was teaching my daughter philosophy, teaching her metaphysics and uh, philosophical psychology, and I said to her, I said, what's the definition of truth? We were just, we were just in the kitchen and I was, you know, fixing food or something, and we were just talking. And I said, what's the definition of truth? And she said, knowing her studies, she said, it's the conformity of the intellect to the extramental reality. And I said, that's correct. I said, now, Elizabeth, you are probably the only 16-year-old in the entire Buffalo area who knows the answer to that question. I said, do you, and I said, do you know what that means? You're a weirdo. <laughs> and she said, I know. <laughs> um, but knowing the Catholic faith really is something that is not, the Catholic faith isn't known amongst Catholics. If you look at the, uh, the Synod preparatory document, when they send out that questionnaire uh, early in 2013, uh, to gain info, you know, to, to kind of gauge where Catholics are and what they think. Vast majorities of Catholics are ignoring the Catholic doctrine regarding marriage. Vast majorities of Catholics are cohabitating. Uh, great numbers of Catholics uh, believe that uh, homosexuality is, is okay. And uh, what's even a little more scary is um, a number of these, a number of the, the bishops who were polled on this they asked them about homosexual unions, homosexual marriage, and thankfully the bishops did say, no, well, we, we can recognize that as something admissible. But then they asked about, well, what about baptizing children who are adopted in, in these unions? The vast majority have said, yes, we should baptize them. Now, the purpose of baptism is not just a ceremony. The purpose of baptism is to bring you into the life of grace and also to provide a Catholic environment in which you will grow up. And the Catholic Church has always taught that if, a Catholic, if someone's going to be baptized and raised in a non-Catholic home, he can't be baptized. Even Pope John Paul II taught that in 1982. So we have gone far away from the most fundamental points of Catholicism. And so uh, that's why uh, we're given this little workshop on catechism. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, 40 minutes is not much. 
uh, to cover the topic, but we will do our best. But we remember, too, Our Lady of Fatima warned that the dogma of faith will be lost. The dogma of faith will be lost around the world. And that uh, in order to live up to what Our Lady expects, we have to learn our faith. And the catechism is the best place to start. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is trying to provide a, a couple of points because uh, I've been teaching catechism for a long time, never really in a formal classroom setting at a school, but I had a lot of adult converts that I've caught, taught over the years. And now, of course, we homeschool, and I, and I teach my own children catechism and, and philosophy. So uh, we're going to be talking uh, on a couple of levels. The first is those who are teaching youngsters. I want to talk about uh, pointers for that. And also those who are trying to spread the faith to others. Uh, for those two, and we're kind of be going, we'll, we'll be going back and forth within this. So, the first point I want to make, and this is raising our children in the faith. I'm going to propose what I consider to be the most important element in raising our children in the faith, and it may not be what you're expecting. You're probably expecting me to say, uh, teach them the catechism from the time they can talk. And they're gonna, gonna, no. I think really the most important element in raising a, in, in, in developing our children in the faith and having a truly Catholic household is to provide in our homes a happy home environment. The home should be a place where our children love to be. The children should like to be with their parents, with the family with other family members, encouraging things like very simple points of basic civilization, like a family eating supper together. I know families that don't eat one meal together. Now there are sometimes, of course, there are circumstances, dad's work schedule, or even because of financial difficulties, mom's work schedule, but a happy environment. And one of the reasons I say this is because I was listening to a lecture of um, uh, somebody, you know, these, these, uh, these people in, in what, we, what we call the Novus Ordo Church, they call themselves youth ministers, even though they're lay people. A lay person really can never be a minister, but anyway. But he said something very interesting. He said that he talks to young people over the age of 18 who have left the faith. Once they got to be 18 years old, supposedly that's the year that you, you, you magically become an adult, you know, even though you might play video games 24 hours a day. Um, you magically become an adult at 18, and all these young people who bolted away from the faith. And he asked them, why did you leave? Why did you leave the Catholic faith? 50%, the highest percentage, 50% responded because of an unhappy home environment. For whatever reason, for however how it happened, the home environment was not happy. I know some traditionalist group uh, people who their idea of keeping their children safe is to build a huge wall around the house. And the children don't get to do anything. And they don't get out. And they're a little too sheltered. And as soon as they have the, 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 uh, the, the opportunity to bolt, they bolt. Okay, a happy home environment. And what happens is, is that the youngster will equate the Catholic faith with unhappiness. His memories of growing up, he will equate the Catholic faith with being unhappy. It's especially if we raise our children with an idea of the faith that it's just a huge list of things that you're not allowed to do. Can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Now believe me, the Catholicism is that. It is a big list of things we are not allowed to do, but it can't be only that. The beauty of the faith, the joy of the faith, the battle joy of the faith uh, has to be part of, of our home environment. So, a happy environment. Um, so that our children will equate Catholicism with happiness. Uh, that's with dealing with children. When we are talking to non-Catholics, we have to also make the conversation a pleasant environment. 
We know how quickly religious discussions can become heated. Take a look at Facebook. This is supposed to be the social network that brings people together. It's a riot. They'll start a little bit, and then it gets more heated and more heated, and by the end, what you have, you have Calvin and Hobbes. This is, you know, this is, <laughs> but we can't let the faith, conversations of the faith, degenerate down to that level. If the other side gets heated, we remain calm. If the, per the person we're talking to loses his cool, we don't lose our cool. And you will find that maybe the next time you, you talk to them, that will be the one thing that impressed them the most. That I got all upset, I got all, I got all bent out of shape, and, you, and, he, and he kept his cool, she kept his cool. Okay, small point it seems, but uh, it is the environment of the faith has to be reasonable, balanced, and happy. Now, another point, the second point I wanted to talk about regarding catechism is a principle that we learn from Aristotle. And that principle is whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. Whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. Very often, you have to talk to people where they are. You have to talk to them on a level that they will understand. The most obvious, of course, is teaching the faith to small children. You don't start them off with transubstantiation. You don't start them off with hypostatic union. You don't start them off with the hylomorphic principle of Aristotle. Okay, they're, 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 they have no idea what we were talking about. I remember, I'm just old enough, I was born in 1958, and I remember dear St. Mary Magdalene, she was the kindergarten teacher at our school in Philadelphia, blue collar neighborhood, packed to the rafters before the Vatican II literally destroyed everything. Um, thousands and thousands of thousands she, uh, uh, cat, uh, kindergarten children she had, and she taught nothing but kindergarten. She taught kindergarten for at least 20 to 25 years. She was about four foot 11. And I remember her, I remember sitting on the rug and her saying, boys and girls, God loves you this much. I got it. I understood. Whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. Just a side note, the amazing thing about Sister Mary Magdalene is she remembered all of our names. We would see her when we were in high school, and she remembered, hello, Robert, hello, James, hello, John. Remembered all of our names. Um, but we talk to children in language that they understand. You know who under, and, and you know who understood this, of all people? Paul McCartney from the Beatles understands this. You ever heard the song Yellow Submarine? Now, the myth, I'm not an apologist for the Beatles, don't worry, but the myth spread around that that was about a little yellow pill. It was about LSD. And that's what the Yellow Submarine was. And it was that, so the whole song was a, was a big LSD trip. Um, I saw an interview with Paul McCartney. He said, Yellow Submarine was originally intended to be a children's song. And that's why I wrote the lyrics with words of one syllable only. In the term when I was born lived a man who sailed the sea. And he told us, you know, we know the whole thing, right? But what's the, whatever is received in the, is received in the manner of the recipient. Any children could sing that song. So that's why with children, what do we start them with? We start them with a simple First Communion Catechism with very simple questions and answers. And what do we do? Who can, what do we do with them? Tell me, what do we do? Do we read it to them or do we make them memorize? Even if they don't understand what they're talking, everything. You get it in first, you get it into their heads first. One of the problems with the Baltimore style catechism, the uh, complaint that's made about it, and it's really a caricature of a complaint, that all they did was learn memorization. 
Well, if you got to freshman year, high school year, college year, maybe not college, that's too much, but freshman year, um, if you were still memorizing, then that was not a good manner to teach because what, you learn the, proofs, the, the, the points of the faith first and then you are given the breadth of understanding through explanations, through church documents, through stories of the saints, through all these things to bring it all alive because what is the catechism? This is basically a skeleton. And no, I've never seen a skeleton live all by itself. It, you need the flesh and the blood and the emotion and the intellect and the will go as part of the human as part of the, the the human person this provides the skeleton that needs to be fleshed out so we know this principle whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient we see our lord uh, acting on this principle bishop sheen uh, gives uh, tells the story of um, what took place in the gospel of john chapter 12 24. he talks about when the greeks visited our lord now, the Douay Reem says the Gentiles visited our Lord at this point, but Sheen, who really knows, knew his scripture, um, he says it was actually the Greeks. And he says, we don't know what our Lord, what the Greeks said to our, our Lord, because it's not recorded in scripture, but we can guess what the Greeks said. The Greeks probably said to our Lord, if you stay here in this land with this people, you will be put to death. Come to Athens. We've never killed any of our own wise men, except Socrates, and we've regretted it ever since. But come here, where, come to Athens where you can teach, where you can live, where you will be safe. Our Lord did not, and Sheen says, we can guess that's what our, the, the Greeks said to our Lord by the answer that our Lord gave. And our Lord did not quote Isaiah or did not quote Jeremiah. He gave them an answer from nature. He said, our Lord said, unless the grain of wheat fall to the ground, dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Whatever is received is received in the manner of the recipient. Okay, he spoke to them in the language they understood, and clearly they got the message. Maybe not as complete as, uh, as a full a theological understanding, but they basically got the message. But I say this because those of us who argue with or have discussions with Protestants, you really can't, you really don't get anywhere quoting the Council of Trent. What you have to do is, if you're going to deal with Protestants, you have to know two things fairly well. You have to know scripture. Now, Scott Hahn says, and I think he's right, they claim, he says, Protestants claim to know all the scripture. He says, I was a Protestant, I can tell you, we knew about 10 verses. So if you know 15 verses, you've got them beat, <laughs> okay? Um, but 15, but, but you have to know scripture, but you also have to know history because one of the things that Protestants do is they pervert, some of them well-meaning because they have been taught this, they pervert our history to claim that the Catholic Church did things it never did or said things it never said. One of my favorite examples of this is um, when I lived in Jersey, I, went, I would go to this True Value hardware store for all of our, you know, I, I was doing a lot of, uh, doing a lot of uh, building back then. And so I was always there and there was this big, fundamentalist Jersey hick, no offense to anyone in Jersey, but uh, big uh, fundamentalist guy named Ellis, and he was a, he was a real you know, Bible thumping, uh, and he handed me this pamphlet, and it was about all the errors and stupidity of the Catholic Church. Now you know in 1907, Pope St. Pius X condemned modernism. Modernism is the belief that truth can change over time. I talked about that, there's, there's more to it. I don't want to go into it all, but it's a very complex philosophical system. He gives me the pamphlet. It says, it talks about all the horrors of the Catholic Church, and then it says the crowning horror was in 1907, Pope Pius X condemned all discoveries of modern science. All right, that was their understanding of modernism. So you have to know your history, and we have to know our scripture. 
If you are arguing with a scientific materialist, you need to know some metaphysics. You need to know some principles of being. We need to know the principle of sufficient reason, and that every effect has to have a cause. And you have to know some science. And you also have, we also have to know the limitations of science. And this is where the modern atheistic science tries to run roughshods over us, claiming that science answers everything. And we have to be able to point out that science answers a lot. Science answers many things, but it doesn't answer everything including the very metaphysical and philosophical principles on which it, it stands. For example, if I, um, uh, was it, was it uh, glycerol and potassium permanganate? Okay, now if I would put together, don't do this at home by the way, but if I would put together glycerol and potassium permanganate, oh, it's great fun, because you put it in a glass and first nothing happens, and then a little, wolf of smoke starts to come up, and then, this, then, and then more smoke, and then more smoke, and then it starts to billow and billow, and at one point, there's this little explosion, and the heat is so intense that it, that it melts the glass that it's in. Okay, it's quite wonderful. Um, but if a, if a scientist said, imagine a scientist who would, who would uh, do his experiments and say, if you combined glycerol and potassium permanganate, you will get some spontaneous combustion. And if you combine glycerol and potassium permanganate, you will not get spontaneous combustion. What has he just done? He's violated the principle of non-contradiction. The principle of non-contradiction is the most basic principle of metaphysics, the principle that everything in science is based on. Children know this. I say to my, well, Benedict's not three anymore, but I would say to Benedict, if I would say to Benedict, Benedict, go get some ice cream. There is a carton of ice cream in the freezer, and also there is not a container of ice cream in the theater. He would stop dead. Okay, these little intellects, they understand the principle of non-contradiction, but the point is, you could canvas and study the works of biology, the works of uh, physics, the works of all types of science. You will never see the principle of non-contradiction demonstrated. Why? Because it is not a scientific principle per se. It is a metaphysical, philosophical principle. So we live in a time when many modern scientists will claim philosophy is just for the birds. It's just uh, this goofy way of seeing things. There are no right or wrong answers. They don't know what philosophy is, and they don't realize that they are basing their science on metaphysics, something that hardly anyone is taught anymore, okay? That's the type of thing we need to know. Uh, and another thing to be on guard, and we've all experienced this, it is, um, well, you'll know what I'm talking about when I quote St. Augustine. St. Augustine, what now, 1,700 years ago? He said, I'm quoting him now, an intellect may be capable of forming an objection and then incapable of understanding the argument that answers the objection. We've all experienced that. It's very easy to throw up an objection and when you try to explain it, you can see it in their eyes. They've, they've, they've completely disconnected. They're short-circuiting. So it's, uh, I'll get into this later a little bit of, of make sh making sure that we are dealing with people of goodwill. Um, good heavens, uh, <laughs> these, these sessions go by so quickly, I'm sorry. Um, another point I wanted to make is in catechism and in basic Catholic theology, we have all the aspects of Catholic truth demonstrated by what you call the three proofs, three forms of proof. Proof from scripture, proof from tradition, proof from reason. If any one of those are lacking, you really don't have the full Catholic doctrine. There's something deficient. Usually with script, I mean I shouldn't say usually, but sometimes with scripture it is more implied than specific, but it's there. 
And the reason um, this method used to be standard teaching in Catholic books on theology. It is no longer there. People aren't taught the basic proofs, especially from reason, to show that our faith is reasonable. Uh, one of the ways, uh, I'm, I'm sidetracking a little bit because it came to mind, is that we have to understand, for example, the moral law does not come from God's will, it comes from God's nature. This is understanding the truths of the faith based on reason, okay? That it is God's nature that he would not be unfaithful. It is God's nature that he would always tell the truth. Therefore, we have the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And I say this because throughout history, and I believe Martin Luther was one of them, who taught that everything, the entire moral law, was simply God's will. He, cho he, just, he, 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 made this, he made this humanity, and he came up with these rules, and he threw them at, 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 at our, our system, as it were, and he could very easily make another planet of human beings and where adultery would be okay. And lying would be okay, because everything is in the will, not nature. The truth is, is that, and we have to understand this when people will accuse us of just thumping the Bible or just saying, well, you just believe everything is, is God's law. No, it goes even deeper than that. Morality is based on our human nature, and that itself is based on the divine nature. And so... Um, Morality comes from the nature of God, and we really need this now because what do we have now? We have the triumph of the human will. And if I say something, it's right out of Humpty Dumpty. When I use a word, it means exactly what I want it to mean. If I want to do something, I can do it. If I want to have an abortion, my will wants it, therefore it's right. If we want to change the definition of marriage so that Ralph and Bruce can get married, so-called, then we can change the definition of marriage. Everything is in the will. No, that's contrary to the nature of marriage itself. It's contrary to the nature of man itself. That's, that's just something we need to keep in mind. But I want to talk about the three proofs, OK? Proof from scripture, proof from tradition, proof from reason. I had said in my first talk, for those who were here, that the primary error of our age is that truth, it's the belief that there can be some transformation of the dogmatic message of the church over the, over the course of the centuries. The belief that truth can change over time. So what I want to do is I want to put together, I want to, I want to tell you this, this little, this, um, uh, the proof from scripture, proof from tradition, proof from reason that I put together to demonstrate that truth, that truth cannot change. First of all, Proof from scripture, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Galatians 1, 8, but, but though we or an angel from heaven preach a gospel to you, besides that which we have preached to you, let him be anathema. Okay, our Lord is telling us truth, objective truth does not change. That's the proof from scripture. We could give more, but we have to move on. Next, proof from tradition, what the church has always taught from the time of the apostles into the present. Pope Saint Agatho, who died in 681, he said, quote, nothing of the things appointed ought to be diminished, nothing changed, nothing added, but they must be preserved both as regards expression and meaning. We're gonna see this later the same meaning, the same explanation, no change. Um, Vatican I taught dogmatically, let therefore the understanding, the knowledge, and the wisdom of individual men, and all men, and of one man, and of the entire church grow and advance greatly and powerfully over the course of the years, but only in its own class, in the same dogma, with the same meaning, and in the same explanation, okay? By the way, 
Um, I don't want to spend too much time on a lot of quotations, but this is the exact same terminology used by St. Vincent of Lyrence in the fourth century to explain the proper development and understanding of doctrine. Yes, we can grow in understanding, but always the doctrine in the same meaning and in the same explanation. The oath against modernism, the man who took that oath, would swear with this hand on the Bible, right hand, I sincerely receive the doctrine of the faith handed down to us from the apostles through the Orthodox Fathers with the same meaning and in the same explanation. Same terminology from St. Vincent of Lawrence. Same terminology from Vatican I. I completely reject, therefore, the heretical fiction of an evolution of dogma changing from one meaning to another, differing from that which the church first held. Okay. Same meaning, same explanation, proof from, proof from tradition. And as you know, well, I don't know if, if everybody was here yesterday, but those who were here for my talk, I opened by quoting Pius X, Pius XI, Pius XII, who were all fighting this very strong heresy growing up in the 20th century and with us to this hour, the idea that truth can change over time. They were constantly fighting that. So, magisterium is easy to, uh, to show that proof, proof from tradition. Next, proof from reason. And for, for this, I will turn to the crown prince of reason, Mr. G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, in his book on orthodoxy, he describes what he sees, uh, how he, what, he describes this, this idea of changeable doctrine. Here's what he says. He says, an imbecile habit has arisen in the modern controversy of saying that such and such a creed can be held in one age but cannot be held in another. Some dogma, we are told, was credible in the 12th century, but not credible in the 20th century. You might as well say that a certain philosophy can be believed on Mondays, but it cannot be believed on Tuesdays. Okay, just basic common sense. So that's what we have. Proof from scripture, the truth does not change. Proof from tradition, and proof from reason. I have more to say about that but I'm running out of time already if we're gonna have questions and answers. Um, okay, so when sharing the faith, it's necessary to try to seek people of goodwill. We don't waste our time arguing with someone who appears to be obstinate. And what the, what, the way that we do this is, and it is a little you know, dicey because we could be mistaken on the way we assess this, but we try to assess whether the person's error is in their intellect or if it's in their will. Makes all the difference in the world. If the error is in the intellect, if they are truly confused, if they were taught the wrong thing or on their own have come to an understanding of the wrong thing, you might be able to discuss and maybe make some points for them to, to, to pull them out of this error. But if their error is in the will, then even if you have a miracle, like the, time of the, like the Pharisees, their error was in their will. They refused to believe our Lord, and our Lord performed miracles, and they, they, would, they were obstinate. Uh, oftentimes, too, people get trapped in their lifestyles that they're living. For example, you start talking to someone about the Catholic faith, and you find out they're in a bad marriage. They're, they're, they've been divorced and remarried and they're living outside the church. And they know enough about the faith to know that if they want to return to the Catholic Church, that means that they have to separate from the person that they're living with. Or at least live like brother and sister. I mean, you have to talk to a priest about this, this type of thing. And that, that will be the great obstacle. And that turns into something in the will. So there are times that we do have to shake the dust from our feet but we try to ascertain whether the error is in the intellect or in the will. Another thing we can do is when talking to someone about the faith, we can start by speaking subjectively. I've done this with Protestants. Rather than saying, you shouldn't be a Protestant, you're gonna go to hell. Don't you know, they just turn and run away. Um, sometimes, what you say is, well, I'll tell you why I could never be a Protestant. I'll 
I'll tell you why I'm not a Protestant. Um, and you can tell them a story, you know, tell them that uh, there's that wonderful story that Scott Hahn tells that he was teaching, he was teaching, it's before his conversion, he was Presbyterian minister, and he was teaching at a school, and some of you probably heard this story, that, um, and one of his sharper guys in class, a young guy, he's probably about 21 years old, he said, uh, Dr. Hahn, do you know the way we Protestants believe that we accept, we, we go by the Bible alone, and only the Bible, and nothing but the Bible as our rule of faith? And Han said, yes. And the student said, where in the Bible does it say that? And Han's response was a knee-jerk response. He said, what a stupid question. Now, the minute when he tells that story, the minute he heard himself say that, he said to himself, you have never answered a student like that before, no matter what the question was. You have never responded to an honest question with an insult. And on the way driving home, he says, he found himself breaking out in a cold sweat. What's the answer to that question? Oh, no, 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 I forgot a spot, I forgot something. Um, I, I forget the scriptural verses, but he, he talked about, uh, well, um, we have the, 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 this, this verse where it says, uh, Scripture, all, all scripture is helpful or something like that. And the student said, well, no, uh, the, the, the scripture says, uh, I mean, scripture says scripture is helpful. It doesn't say the Bible alone. And then he quoted something about our Lord condemning tradition. And the student said, well, no, uh, our Lord wasn't condemning all tradition. He was condemning corrupt tradition. So they ran out of time in the class, which was, you know, he was, uh, Han was very happy about that. Okay, well, we'll pick this up next week. <laughs> Um, and he drove home in a cold sweat. What is the answer to that question? So he telephoned all the Protestant divines that he could think of, all of the big wigs, the muckety mucks in, 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 in Presbyterian area, or whatever you would call it. And he said, you know, maybe I slept through this in the seminary or something, but you know, we Protestants believe the Bible alone and nothing but the Bible as our sole rule of faith. Where in the Bible does it say that? Does it say that? And the man at the end of the line said, what a stupid question. <laughs> and so the, so the, the divine would say, well, our, our Lord, uh, I mean, St. Paul says that the scripture is, is helpful. I forget the verse. And Han responded the way a student did. Well, it doesn't say it's, it's the sole rule of faith. It just says it's helpful. Well, our Lord condemned tradition in Matthew. Was, yes, we didn't condemn all tradition. He just condemned corrupt tradition. And he was left. That was one of the main things that brought him into the Catholic faith. He had never even thought before that the very foundation of Bible alone is not biblical. Isn't that wild? It's not biblical. And that was, and so that's the type of thing you could, you could just tell them that story and say, this is, this is the reason why I could never be a Protestant. If something that fundamental can't be answered, well then, that's only the beginning of my problems with the Protestant system, you know. So, subjectivism, starting with something subjective, it's not a bad place to start, it's just a bad place to stay, to leave everything in the realm of subjective. You're okay, I'm okay, you know, that, that type of thing. But um, anyway, uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, a subjective approach, this is what I do too when people ask me about the old mass and the new mass. I never tell somebody they shouldn't go to the new mass. I just tell them why I don't go. And I find that to be more effective than, than you know, trying to talk someone out. Because you know, human nature being what it is, as soon as you start saying, as soon as someone says to you, you shouldn't be doing that, what do you do? <laughs> the defenses go up. And who the blazes are you anyway to, to, uh, to tell me what to do and to invade my space? You know, I mean, you know how it's like. So, <laughs> so um, we're starting to run out of time because I do want to leave some time for questions. But... Uh, we brought this with us here. It's the new St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. Do not be fooled by the word new. Um, new meaning this was new in 1960. Uh, it is the conventional catechism. Now, what do we get in any catechism worth its salt? It's the basic structure. Okay, what is the Catholic faith? It is doctrine, 
that which we know to be true, not just that we believe, that, but that we know. Faith is a form of knowledge, not a sentimental belief. The very definition of faith, can anybody give it to me? Who can give me a def the definition, the basic catechism definition of faith? Yes, I am. Anybody want to give it a shot? Faith is the adherence of our intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing. Okay, it's not a pious, wow, it's just like so nice. It just makes me feel good. You know, that's not worth anything. Okay, faith is the adherence of our intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing, which means faith is knowledge. It's not just an empty belief, it is knowledge. And this is one thing we really have to impress into our children. Because even if those who you were here, who were here for Brian McCall's, and they're talking about abortion, and we hear bishops saying, well, the church believes that it's a human life. No, it is a human life, and that's why the church teaches it. Okay, you start with the objective reality. Now, when I'm talking to someone, sometimes you start, as I said, you, you start objectively, well, we believe this for this reason, but then you take them to the fact that it is an objective knowledge and not just a pious belief. Okay, so the truths of the faith. Truths of the faith, how do, well, let me, let me finish this. I'll get ahead of myself. The truths of the faith, doctrine, those things that we know. On the authority of God revealing. Now, if Father Gruner came in here and said, I, I don't know the name of this highway here. Anybody know the name of it? 94. I was driving down 94, and two miles down the road, a truck overturned and burst into flames. Okay? There's not one person in this room who would doubt that he actually saw that. Even though we didn't see it, even though we were in here, and we didn't hear the sirens or anything like that, we are going on the word of someone whom we know to be knowledgeable and truthful. And when that person, Father Gruner, tells us, I saw this truck explode two miles down the road, we know it's true based on his word. That is human faith. We're giving human faith to his word. To our Lord, we give divine faith. Okay, our Lord is what? Knowledgeable. He is, he is knowledge, the source of all knowledge, and he is truthful, the source of all truth, truth itself. So when he tells us something about himself, for example, that he is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons in one, we know it to be true. That's why the definition of faith is what it is, the adherence of our intellect to a truth revealed by God on the authority of God revealing. Once we know what the truths of the faith are, then we know morals, behaviors, do's and don'ts. We learn what we ought to do and ought not to do. We learn, as Dr. Waters would say, we learn the oughty so we're not naughty. All right. All right. <laughs> we learn the oughty so we're not naughty. Well, that's exactly what the catechism does to us, does for us, a good catechism like this simple one. Um, you get the entire Apostles' Creed, and you get all the subsections of the truths of the faith in the Creed. For example, I believe in one holy Catholic, we, I believe in the, the, the Catholic Church, okay? Well, the, 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 the uh, catechism doesn't stop with that. Then it gives you the oneness of the Church, the one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. You get all the teaching regarding the Church within that section of the creed, okay? So, we get the doctrine of the faith. Then what do we get after that? We get the oughty so we won't be naughty. We get the morals, what is, what is in here, we get the Ten Commandments, okay? The ten, and we learn, too, that thou shalt not kill. There's a lot of subsections to that. Thou shalt not kill, uh, a sin against the Fifth Commandment, is also speaking nasty to someone speaking hurtful to someone. You're not killing them, but that's the work that's being done, a deliberate hurting. Um, we know that uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. We learn from the catechism a number of things about truth telling. The fact that the difference between calumny and detraction. Calumny is 
telling bad things about someone that, that is not true. Detraction is saying bad things about someone when it is true and it's unnecessary. Well, it's true. How many times have we heard that? You shouldn't say that. Well, it's true. It's called calumny. It's a sin against the Eighth Commandment. Okay, we get all this in the section on the commandments. Then we get, okay, how I need the intellect, which is giving me the truths of the faith. Okay, got that. Then I've got the aughty, the Ten Commandments, how I'm supposed to live, how I, how can I rev up my, well, I need light from my mind to really understand the faith better. I need strength of my will so that I can live the aughty so I'm not naughty. And we get that from the seven sacraments, which is the next section of the catechism. Living the supernatural life of grace that gives light to the mind and strength to the will. And finally, the last section on that flows from the sacraments is prayer. Okay, now, um, if, you, if you don't have a, a catechism, we have a small stack back there. Uh, I find adults need it. I, I, I use it. I use it. But I've also found that when I'm teaching catechism, I have never found one book that does it all for me. Uh, the best books I have found to teach catechism, this is, is your basic your basic text, because everything's here and it's not threatening, because look how, look how skinny it is. Okay, it's, you, know, you don't have one of these you know, thick books. But there is the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which is basically the same format, creed, commandments, sacraments, and the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. Okay, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. There is a magnificent, magnificent catechism that's out of print. Tan reprinted it for a while, it was called The Catechism Explained by Father Francis Spirago. I'll spell it for you. S-P-I-R-A-G-O. Father Francis Spirago. Magnificent catechism because it has this full outline that I talked about here, but also you get examples from the lives of the saints. You get a lot of scriptural support. You get devotional things. Of, 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 you know, you just don't learn about the rosary, but you get tips on how to pray the rosary. It's about that thick, it's, it's, it's magnificent. Tan is letting it go out of print. I don't know why. Well, maybe I do know why. But, uh, cause Tan's on a new, new leadership now. But anyway, um, and, and also, the, then, then the final question I'm asked is, would you use the new catechism? I would not, and I do not. Uh, first of all, the new catechism is primarily the catechism to further the agenda of the Second Vatican Council. Secondly, a lot of the terminology is, um, I mean, yeah, there's good things in it. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking, uh, taking away the, anything that's good in it, but it's got that, that kind of softer, kind of more effeminate um, style of writing that, that, that we find in the Vatican II documents. I mean, I'm not interested in fruitful osmosis or anything like that, you know, the type of thing they say. And, um, but also, um, you have to be careful with the new catechism. Now, I just mentioned in the catechism, this catechism and the catechism of the Council of Trent, I just mentioned the section on the church, one holy Catholic apostolic. Okay, that's what we learn in this catechism, and that's what we learn in any good catechism, and that's what's in the new catechism. But when we get there, what do we find? Well, in the Council of Trent Catechism, we are reminded of Ephesians 4. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's part of the unity of the church. One faith, in other words, one body of belief, one revelation given by our Lord, to which we, had, we, we attach our intellect, and that is the Catholic faith. And there is only one faith. I can't stand when I hear people say, oh, it's a meeting of all faiths. That is a misuse of the word. I had an old, believe it or not, an old traditional Jesuit, but one did exist that I knew. And um, he, he really pounded that into me, the proper understanding of the word faith. You can't say faiths. There's no such thing. Anyway. Um, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. In the new Vatican II Catechism, a lot of what happens within the post-conciliar and the Vatican II documents is things are not denied, we just have crucial omissions. 
things that should be affirmed that are not affirmed. And that failure to affirm makes all the difference. In the New Catechism, in the section on the church, you will not find Ephesians 4, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I could give an entire talk on the documents of Vatican II and how that problem, crucial omissions, is so much part of taking us down this new direction. And I don't think it's very hard for any of us to understand how important an omission can be. A wife living with her husband starts to get the sense that maybe there's something wrong. And one day she says to her husband, honey, do you love me? Well, we've been married for 20 years. Yes, but honey, do you love me? Well, we have five children and uh, they've, they've been very successful and they're great joy to our lives. Yes, but honey, do you love me? Well, we got this nice house, we've got a swimming pool, we got a very... Yes, but honey, do you love me? See, that failure to affirm means everything. It's a crucial element in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, those things that are failed to affirm, such as that there is only one true church outside of which there's no salvation, just one example among many, and a failure in the new catechism by that omission, and I would say because of the ecumenical movement, a deliberate omission of Ephesians 4. And also you will find in the New Catechism, in the section on the oneness of the church, you will find that the new ecumenical movement is promoted. Um, I can only remember one from memory where it says that seminarians should receive an ecumenical formation. Okay, that's in the New Catechism. Things like that in there. So, as I said, this catechism, Catechism of the Council of Trent, and the Spirago Catechism, um, the, the Catechism Explained. Um, there's another very good series for high schoolers, a four-volume series called Our Quest for Happiness. Our Quest for Happiness. I think it's still in print. I think the same, is the St. Benedict Center, Father, printing that? Yeah, it is superb. It is first rate, and it's an the good thing is, it's an entire four-year course, and that way your religion, if you're teaching, especially homeschooling your children, you don't have the problem we have now in education is everything is fragmented because we're pulling from all different sources, okay? This is a entire four-year course, our quest for happiness, that has a unity thematically through the whole thing. So I could talk a lot more, but I also would like to take we only have about eight or 10 minutes for questions. Um, I, if whoever asks me a question, I want to repeat it so that everybody hears it. If I don't repeat it, wave your hand and say, you didn't repeat it. So does anybody have any questions? Yes. Just a year or two ago, I was a sponsor for somebody that became Catholic. Mm -hmm. And she gave information like the catechism. It was a red book. Is, can she still use that, or should I suggest? Because she just became a new Catholic. Should I suggest okay. so, that? So the question is, someone who became a new Catholic, they had a catechism of some sort. It's very hard to tell because I, I don't know what she had. But you could get this for anyway. Okay. You know, you could because you don't have to say, you don't have to give it to her and say, you probably didn't learn the right thing, so here it is. You know, <laughs> you'll say, uh, this, this, will, this will help you grow in the faith, you know, or, or something like that. Anybody else? Yes. Um, we talked about the sin of detraction, so if we speak about the bad things that are going on with the Pope, is that detraction? Well, um, I'll give you a distinction on that. The thing is, if we speak about the bad things going on with the Pope, is that detraction? Um, yes and no, in this way. Suppose I'm invited to dinner with the Pope, and as we're, wait, he, I'll, I'll, we're waiting for him to come in, and he comes in rip-roaring drunk. Rip-roaring drunk. How you doing, everybody? Isn't it great to be here? Okay? And I see that. Maybe I would say something to the Pope's aides, to his staff, but I wouldn't go home and write that up in Catholic Family News. That is a private fault, 
and no one needs to know about it. But if the Pope stands up and gives the impression by his actions and as we were talking about by his omissions that maybe we're going to have a change of practice that divorced and remarried Catholics can receive communion and you have Cardinal Casper giving a speech where he promotes this and then February 2nd, 22nd, the next day, Pope Francis endorses the speech and thanks him publicly and says, this is what I call doing theology on your knees, that's a direct quote, then for the sake of the faith, we do stand up and say what he's doing is a danger to the faith. It's a danger to my faith. I have three children. It's a danger to their faith. So personal sins we would keep quiet about, but public things that affect the faith, we actually have a duty to speak out. And you'll see too, this is the key to understanding judge not. You know, the judge not, is, well, I, I could go into that, but I want to take your questions. Any, any, anybody else? Yes, sir. I've heard that, um, I've read, some people have recommended the uh, catechism of St. Pius X. Um, yes. Yeah, it's, uh, the, reason, the, re the reason I didn't mention it because, well, actually, uh, I correct myself here. I was about to say it is, alas, yet one more great Catholic book that's out of print. But I, got, I, got it on my Kindle. I was just going to say, you can get it on Kindle. <laughs> There's an app for that. It's like awesome. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's actually there's been a number of things, a number of things made available on on Kindle that are out of print. But yes, if if you have a Kindle, and you can get, and I think it costs what eighty five cents or something. I mean, it, or it might be for free. It's it's, it's ridiculous. It's but yeah, um, catech, catechism of uh, of um, Pius the uh, Pius, the, and it's interesting because. Baltimore Catechism, how does it start? Who can, who, can, who can tell me how it starts? Who made me? God made me. Okay. Catechism of Pope St. Pius X just starts a little different. It's the same doctrine. Are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Why are you a Christian? And that's how that starts. So a little different approach, but basically to the same structure. Creed, commandments, sacraments, our Father. We only have time for one more question. Oh, hi, yes. Uh, your definitions of faith and truth, what are, the, are those quotes from St. Thomas Aquinas? Well, the definition of faith is basically um, what the church teaches. The, 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 the adherence of the intellect to a truth revealed by God, you'll find it in, in all the catechism. And also, it tallies with common sense. It tallies with reality. Um, truth, the adherence, the, the adequation, the correspondence of the intellect with the external reality, that's based on St. Thomas Aquinas, but also St. Thomas Aquinas said it because it is true. Um, the modern notion is actually something I mentioned yesterday, coming from a modernist philosopher named Maurice Blondel, who says, the truth is the conformity of my intellect with life. Deadly, deadly definition. Why? Because the life of man changes over time and society changes over time, and societal life will change over time. So if truth is the conformity with my intellect to life, just left open with the omissions, okay, things that should be there that should, not, uh, should, uh, that, that should be there that are not there, then that takes us right into evolutionary and progressivist uh, <coughs> understanding of truth, that everything is always in a state of flux. And it's like what Chesterton said, it's like saying that a certain philosophy can believe on Mondays, but not on Tuesdays. So that's all we have time for. Yes. We, yes. I just want to ask you one question. Um, the, uh, and I've been trying to figure out how to phrase this. Vatican II, is that not doctrine? No. It's not. No, it was a pastoral council. It was a pastoral council. So the omissions or the things that are wrong with Vatican II is not an example of the infallibility no, there's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing infallible about the Second Vatican Council. In fact, um, the, uh, the bishops at Vatican II, especially uh, along with Archbishop Lefebvre, they asked Cardinal Felice for what's called the theological note. Okay, what is the doctrine, what is the theological weight 
of these documents. And Felice said, we have to make a distinction between the things that are, the th we, we, we have to first look at those things that have already been the subject of dogmatic definitions. Those things that have already been the subject of dogmatic definitions, we are bound to obey, but in a certain sense, not because of Vatican II, but because they're already what the church taught. But then he said, those things that have a novel character, we must make reservations. Now, you don't talk like that about the Council of Trent. You don't talk like that about Vatican I. You do talk like that about Vatican II because it is a unique event in the history of the church. And one of the problems, as I said, with Vatican II is these deliberate omissions, things that should be there that are not there. And that is why, I know this shocks some people, but that is why we can say that Vatican II is evil. The philosophical use of the word evil. If I'm holding a stone, I don't say, or a rock, I don't say the rock is blind. I say the rock is sightless. Because seeing, the sense of sight does not belong by nature to the rock. But if I have my poor horse, who is blind, I don't say he's sightless, I say he's blind. Why? Because there's the lack of the, good, the do good. D-U-E. Do good. The good that should be there that's not there. And that constitutes blindness, and in the objective philosophical order, that constitutes an evil, the lack of a do good. And this is why we can say Vatican II is, is an evil council, because there are very definite goods that should be there that were purposely omitted, but that's another talk. So thank you for your attention. We have some catechisms back there, and I'm available to chat too uh, whenever you want. Thank you. I have come to warn the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must not continue to offend our Lord, who is already deeply offended. Final vision on October 13, 1917. Our Lady silently held out the scapular, a gesture which indicates that she wants everyone to wear it.
Our Lady said, If my requests are not heeded, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. Raising up wars and persecutions against the Church, the good will be martyred. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, and various nations will be annihilated. Pray, pray a great deal and make sacrifices for sinners, for many souls go to hell because they have no one to make sacrifices and pray for them. The Blessed Virgin gave us a message how to have world peace, that only, that only she can help us. But perhaps we don't get enough perspective. We say, well, nothing dramatic has happened. And it's because our commentators, our newspapers, our editor writers, the people that we really pay attention to, the people that speak on television in the mainstream press and so forth, people who are under the pay of the enemy often, have yet to point out to us that since we have despised Our Lady's message, 
as a, the human family, we've despised it. There have been 1,686,570,000 violent deaths as a direct result of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima. That is, again, one billion. That is one with nine zeros after it, plus another 686 million people who have died violently for the one simple reason that we've ignored Our Lady of Fatima. We could point out, perhaps another time, that if this is not enough perspective to give us that in these 95 years of ignoring Our Lady of Fatima, we have paid a tremendous price. But as bad as that is, that price will be doubled or tripled in the next couple of years if we ignore her much longer. Just a few months ago, the world's population passed seven, seven billion people. Seven billion people. <laughs> Scripture tells us and other prophecies tell us that one third to two thirds of the entire population of mankind will be wiped out in this war to come. I don't know what it takes to wake us up. Maybe we have to find it on NBC or CBS or some commentator in the New York Times before we finally take this seriously. And maybe we say to ourselves, we take it seriously but I think we don't take it seriously enough. We have many priorities. Sometimes I wonder how I get through my day between what I'm supposed to do today, between getting up and doing my reading, uh, doing my other work, talking to people that, that God wants me to talk to and so forth. And we only all have 24 hours a day. And I'm sure that my life is not as busy as the bishops and the, and the Pope. But we must make this priority number one. There is nothing more serious, nothing more important, nothing more urgent than Our Lady's message at Fatima. And this is something that I don't know how to say. I remember getting a letter from an older bishop many years ago. I think he was in Ottawa. And he said to me basically in his letter, Father Gruner, if you would not raise your voice so much. If you would not yell at us, we might start paying attention to you. And I said, wrote back to him and I said, I appreciate very much your interest and your concern and your advice. Now, if you can tell me how I can do that any better than what I'm doing and get the attention, I'd be very happy to do it. I hate yelling at people. I hate raising my voice and I hate trying to draw attention to myself. But there's no other way around on this message. If there's something more important, and certainly yesterday we were in this March for Life here in Rome, and the number of people that are killed by abortion since about 1980-75 by the statistics we, we looked up is about 1,300,000 people. And by war, there's another 78 million people. And then by government murder, not only in Russia and China, but other parts of the world, 238 million people. These are catastrophic, and they lead us to think that we are, as Pope Pius XII, rather Pius X, St. Pius X said, that we are in the days just before the coming of the Antichrist. These proportional, these things that are happening to us, which Pope Benedict, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, said, that refer to this Fatima message is found in sacred scripture, that we are living the times of the apocalypse. And although we can be distracted with everything from daily newspapers to uh, new movies or whatever else it is that, that, in, that entertains us, these things are happening around us and they're happening every day. And they're happening in such a way that uh, how can we deny that we're living in, if it's not the apocalypse, if it is not the, the time coming before the Antichrist, it is the best, uh, shall we say, um, preview or uh, event which would, the world has never seen before. 
just looking at the Catholic Church, for example, the only other time in church history that comes close to this time is the Arian crisis, when 90% of the bishops were Arian. And there was only one, about three or four bishops who actually stood up. And the greatest of them all, St. Athanasius, was actually excommunicated by the Pope in 357 AD. Now, he wasn't really excommunicated because as the church has always recognized, as St. Thomas points out, that law is not something that just the legislator says. Law is the ordination of reason. It is for the common good. And as the church law to this day points out that no one can be punished if he doesn't commit a crime. So because Athanasius was standing up for the faith, because he was defending the faith, which was his duty to do, he could not be punished even if the Pope pronounced a sentence of excommunication. In fact, Liberius regretted his action, but Liberius is the first Pope not to be canonized from the time of St. Peter to the year 357. It's well for us to remember then that we need not be afraid of the judgments of men if we are on the right, on the right side of God. It's a principle that we need to keep in mind we also have to understand that, that prophecy is a function in the church. It's a function that will never go away. It's a function that must be respected, just as the apostolic offices must be respected. As St. Paul tells us in Ephesians, the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, not just the apostles. The role of prophecy is essential Scripture tells us that we must not extinguish the spirit. We must not despise prophecy, but we must test all things and hold fast that which is good. So that is why I've promoted the message of Fatima, not only because it's unique among all the messages, but of course it's been approved by the church. As Father Joseph St. Marie pointed out, here in Rome, he's the one who wrote the speech for the Pope in 1982 when he went to Fatima. Father Joseph St. Marie points out that it is the role of the hierarchy to judge, to test whether the prophet speaks the truth. But once the hierarchy recognizes that the message comes from God, then the Pope himself and the bishops are bound to obey, not the prophet, but God who speaks through the prophet to them. That obligation is primordial. That is not for us to say, I'm telling the Pope what to do. No, but Our Lady Fatima is telling him what to do. All I do is explain what it means. I answer the objections of theologians or others who haven't had the time to think about it. So when we get back to 1917, Our Lady comes. She comes and gives a message to show mankind the way to peace. She was asked, she was insisted that she come. She comes and she explains. And then for the next 95 years, we basically ignore her. So our Lord himself in 1931 explained to the Pope and the bishops something, a lesson from history. He said, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like the King of France, they will follow him into misfortune. What is that, what is that example he's talking about, the King of France? On the 17th of June, the, to the very day, the 17th of June, 1689, our Lord spoke to St. Margaret Mary and told her to tell the King of France to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Now the kings of France, there were three of them from that day, all ignored St. Margaret Mary's prophecy and our Lord's command through St. Margaret Mary. Even during her lifetime, St. Margaret Mary was known as a saint. She was not some, she was well hidden, but she, her reputation for sanctity was well known among her contemporaries. And so for them to ignore this, they paid with their lives. On the 17th of June, 1789, that's 100 years later to the day, the King of France was stripped of his authority by the Third Estate. Three weeks later, the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, 
On, a, on the 20th or 21st of January, 1994, his head was cut off by the soldiers of the revolution. And our Lord makes reference to this and says, make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France, in delaying the execution of my command, like him, they will follow him into misfortune. Up until now, basically, the popes and the bishops around him have ignored, have delayed, have had one excuse after another. Uh, I think I've heard them all. And as we've had proven at these conferences before, none of those excuses really hold water. There is really no excuse for not doing it. However, that is not their choice up to now. Our Lady makes miracles happen all the time, and the Pope, of course, I think if it's up to Our Lady, he's going to view this DVD and see what we have to say and see the trouble we're in. Governments, social societies, and sadly, even many parish priests and diocesan bishops, even some Vatican officials are not responding seriously and properly to these diabolical threats to our lives and souls that we face today. Holy Father, your flock is desperate, vulnerable, and confused amidst the catastrophic dangers their lives and souls are in. We are deeply concerned for the future of our children and, most important, for the welfare of their souls. The whole world is despondent and unified in one anguished cry. What hope have we? Holy Father, you hold that hope. That solution is in the palm of your hand. Only you can save your flock and the world. And that is by obedience to the holy request of the Mother of God herself, Our Lady of Fatima, who said of herself, only I can help you. All she asks is for you, Holy Father, together with all the Catholic bishops of the world, at the same time to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, a mere five-minute prayer. Holy Father, you need not worry about any repercussions or threats that we all hear about today are being hurled at him. Have confidence, Holy Father. Have confidence in Our Lady's promise. Heaven does not make mistakes. God created the miracle of the Son and fulfilled prophecies made at Fatima for you, Holy Father, so you would believe and do as Our Lady of Fatima requests. Trust in the loving guidance that Our Lady of Fatima gives you. Trust in her maternal promise of protection, as you yourself have nurtured your flock to do. Our Lady requested the consecration of Russia, not the world. She was specific, and Our Lady does not mince words. Please, Holy Father, take Our Lady's words seriously and literally. We cannot change a formula prepared in heaven by God himself, which he sent you through his Holy Mother. Holy Father, when you baptize a baby called John Paul, you don't say, I baptize all the babies in the world. It would not be valid. Holy Father, when you consecrate a new church, Our Lady of Fatima Church, you don't just say, I consecrate the churches in the world. It would not be valid. Without mentioning John Paul by name, you would not have effected that baptismal consecration. You would not have set aside that specific baby, John Paul, for God. Without mentioning Our Lady of Fatima Cathedral by name, you would not have effected that consecration. You would not have set aside that specific cathedral for God. 
Neither, and I must emphasize this, neither can you effect the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary if you do not mention Russia by name. Consecrating all the countries in the world, again, does not set aside Russia for God. The consecration would be invalid and it does not and it will not have the promised effect. Holy Father, you better than I know this. You are our shepherd. We look to you for guidance and protection against the diabolical forces that prey after our souls on a daily basis. And so we are confused as to why you have not done the consecration of Russia according to the formula Our Lady requested and which God himself commanded. Holy Father, time has run out. Our Lady offered us the only solution, but only through you. Every day of delay in making this consecration, many, many more souls and lives are lost. Today, even thousands upon thousands of souls are already being persecuted, tortured, imprisoned, murdered for their faith. Please do not delay any longer. Please protect your flock. Please consecrate Russia now before it is too late for us. And even for yourself as the vision of the third secret foretells. Holy Father, we pray for you daily. Save us, save our children. Save yourself from the horrible chastisements prophesied by Jesus and Mary if you do not hasten to fulfill Our Lady of Fatima's request now. Holy Father, now is the time to show Our Lady of Fatima your trust in her and your obedience to her command. 